Disney employees are facing jail time after they're caught in an undercover sex bust. Guardians of Innocence, and this is our second in this particular operation, of babies as young as diapers. This is the most horrific conduct you can ever understand in your entire life. It makes your blood boil. And then there's Roger Caddy. He's 53. It's reported to us by him that he makes a six-figure salary. He's been employed 22 years by Disney. His children of preference are as young as three years of age, and research shows that they don't change. Almost every time we attend one of these press conferences, there's someone working for uh, Disney. This is where Alan Treister lives. When he was arrested, he told them his goal had always been to have sex with a 14-year-old boy. Neighbors tell us they'd see him leave here, drive past their houses, wearing his Disney uniform, and now on unpaid leave, according to Disney. Creepy. That is, that is sick. 24-year-old Oliver Lovett is a youth entertainment host on the Disney Magic. The alleged victim said that he was playing inside the Oceaneer Kids Lab. This was on the ship back in April. Lovett was caught on camera touching a 10-year-old boy inappropriately. Charges have been dropped against a former Disney Cruise Line youth host accused of fondling a young boy aboard a ship. Disney passengers say they trust the entertainment giant. Well, Disney, they have like safety, like words you're supposed to give. For, nobody can take your child. Parents we talk to say they usually don't have a problem letting staff on ships watch their kids. I got three kids myself, like kind of scared now to put them in the kids club tomorrow. She's literally trying to get away from him. I mean, you see her kicking her legs at, at one point, just trying to pull away from him. That 2012 attack occurred at Port Canaveral while passengers were still boarding. We weren't going for another two hours or so. Taplin, who has more than 17 years experience as a police officer, says she offered to call her contacts at the FBI and Port Canaveral Police. What was the reaction when they, you spoke up about it? It was just one that you keep your mouth shut. Taplin claims the ship's second in command instructed her not to pick up the phone. And I was ordered not to be making any phone calls to anybody. <laughs> Instead, the Disney Dream left Port Canaveral on schedule, with the young victim and the suspected crew member, Milton Braganza, still on board. This man, Richard Morgan, has been taken into custody. He is a stage tech at Disney World. He met the victim's mom online. The woman from California would visit him with her three little children that he often talked about, loving the children and being a good dad to them. There's one neighbor I talked to who thought she knew him well, is devastated. I remember when my son was 15 months old and I couldn't have imagined that someone doing it that to my son. I would kill them. This is Disney's statement. They said he has been placed on unpaid leave pending the outcome of the charges. Deputies say he admitted though to molesting three different infants. <laughs> Transitioning from Disney to this was easy. The type of mistreatment that I was still dealing with at that time, that everyone around me saw and did nothing. We will talk about some of the craziest scenes in Disney movies that have some secret messed up meanings. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. Hi, guys. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I want to talk about Disney and the disturbing pattern that reminds me of the Nickelodeon video that I did. I just want to thank my subscribers for your support, especially with my merch. You guys really seem to like the t-shirt and the hoodies that say hear me out in the front. So I just want to say really thank you so, so much if you got some of my merch. And even if you didn't get my merch, if you just watch my videos, I appreciate you too. And if you are new here, hi. This is me. I wear a tinfoil hat and I talk about true crime and conspiracies, especially cases where it's kind of both. Since we're talking about Disney, I think we should start with Walt Disney himself. There are a lot of messed up rumors about Walt Disney, but for the purposes of this video, I want to focus on one rumor. And this is, I'm saying it's a rumor because it's written about in a book but there's no way to verify it and it's like the unauthorized book about Disney so it's, 
I can't say for sure, you know, this is a fact. So that's my, you know, disclaimer. The book is called Hollywood Babylon Strikes Again, which already is quite the title. According to this book, Walt Disney was in love with Bobby Driscoll. Now, Bobby Driscoll was a kid star. He starred in the very controversial movie Song of the South. He worked with Disney for a while. He also was the voice of Peter Pan. And I want to read you a quote from Bobby Driscoll. He was quoted as saying, I was dropped like garbage when I was no longer a cute little kid and I didn't appeal to Walt anymore. Now, the rumors are that Walt Disney was in love with Bobby and there were other rumors that Walt Disney used to have these rent boys that he was gay and he would pay them somebody's on the record saying that he got paid in this like LA apartment to do things with Walt and so they're kind of taking that and they're saying that you know he had inappropriate relations with this little boy Bobby and what's adding to the rumors is the fact that he was discarded as soon as he like reached a uh, you know, teenage, and then he died very young, I think at like 31, from an overdose, and when he died, he was penniless and homeless, and a lot of people say that, you know, he ended up that way because of what he went through as a child star. He won an Oscar, and you know, he was very popular. He went from a very high high to a very low low. That's just a little thing I wanted to mention about Walt Disney himself regarding kids, but now I wanna talk about like actual facts. Let's fast forward to 1995. There was a movie called Powder. The old folks may have kept him down there like some kind of a family secret. What's your name? Powder. I've never seen anything like it. Test shows that you're a genius. You have the most advanced intellect in the history of humankind. Why you look like that? You look like some kind of vampire from outer space or something. <laughs> What are you doing? What happened in that classroom is impossible. From the first moment, I had this feeling that you would change everything I knew. It's like this movie about basically like not judging people, whatever, whatever. The point is, when this movie came out, there was a protest. And the guy who led the protest was a kid who had starred in the director's movies before Powder, and this director was convicted of abusing this boy. Not only was he convicted, they found footage, okay, that he filmed. Remember, he's a director. They found footage of him with this boy um, having oral sex. So the director is called Victor Salva. The victim was Nathan Winters. When all this horrific stuff happened, it was during the filming of this movie that Nathan starred in and Victor was directing. The movie was called Clown House. The clowns. The clowns, Randy, they're here. The darkest of dark, though the flesh is young and the hearts are strong, the precious life cannot be all. <laughs> The circus can be the main event for many a young boy. But for Casey, all this clowning around is about to come to an end. Clown House. The director, Victor, was convicted and he ended up only serving 15 months out of his three year sentence for what he did. And then he was on parole, he was registered, but he still was able to work in Hollywood. And so when he was doing this movie and it was for Disney and it was a kid's movie, he was gonna be around a bunch of kids while he was filming the movie, just like he was when, you know, when he was with Nathan. Um, when it came time to release the movie, Nathan and his friends went and protested. And so I wanna read you some quotes from this article that was published in 1995. It says, on Monday night, Winters, remember that's Nathan Winters, and five friends picketed outside the industry screening of Powder, handing leaflets about Salva's conviction to hundreds of grim-faced Hollywood executives leaving the theater. 
Please don't spend your money on this movie, the leaflets urged. It would just go to line the pockets of this child molester. The friends toted signs, Victor Salva, writer, director, child molester, and support the victim, not the victimizer. When the representatives for Disney were confronted with this, they were like, well, he served his time and you know, it's over. This is in the past. The guy who owned the studios that filmed the movie said he paid for his crime. He paid his debt to society. And then the Disney spokesman, John Dreyer said, what's the point other than you want to make headlines? As part of this article, they interviewed police who gave statistics saying that, you know, the people who commit these kind of crimes are usually never cured and have a higher tendency to repeat this crime again and again and again in comparison to other crimes, right? So that lends credence to the idea that, you know, he shouldn't be doing kids movies when that's what he did the last time he was doing kids movies. Now I want to read you this part of the article because it's very disturbing. It talks about the producer and what the producer knew and how he didn't tell anyone about this. Producer Burnham said that he was tipped about Salva's history halfway through powder filming and confronted him. Told only the basics, Birnbaum elected to neither dismiss Salva nor inform the entire cast and crew. And keep in mind that this happened to Nathan when he was eight years old and it continued for four years because not only was Nathan groomed, his mother was groomed too. She says that they met in 1981 when he was working at a daycare center where one of her friends had a daughter enrolled. Interesting that he chose to work at a daycare center. Uh, she says, quote, he was making his own little video called The Goblin's God and I was helping to sculpt the goblin's face. She said Salva became a trusted family friend and in 1986 directed Something in the Basement, a 35 minute video that starred her son. Although Disney is not necessarily guilty of anything in the sense of like they didn't do anything to this kid and who knows how much they knew because the producer seemed to not tell anyone, uh, the weird part is their complacency and then the cover-ups that you'll see in other cases that I'm going to talk about. It's really disturbing because you would think that even if it was exposed, if they were seen as acting on it immediately and nipping it in the bud, it would help improve their image. But them trying to, you know, brush it under the rug, even though it's eventually going to come out, it only makes them look worse. It makes them look like they're somehow involved. You know what I mean? My conspiracy allegedly don't sue me. I want to talk about another article which really discusses the cover-ups at Disney. This one was published in 1998. I want to read from this because it is, it's like one bombshell after the next. So it says, with 20 years experience as an investigative reporter, Brian Ross of ABC News knows a good story when he hears one. Now remember, Disney bought ABC. Now they're one company. Um, he is also not stupid. He knew the story he heard last spring might raise difficulties because it involved ABC's parent, the Walt Disney Company, but he thought he had enough solid information to pursue it. The story involved accounts of pedophilia and lax security at theme park resorts, including Walt Disney World. Once Mr. Ross and his longtime producer partner, Rhonda Schwartz, had finished their reporting, they thought they had a solid investigative piece for 2020, ABC's news magazine program. But the report was killed last week, or at least shelved. ABC News executives refused to discuss the reasons in detail and have urged those involved not to discuss the matter publicly. Disney issued a statement saying that its executives had nothing to do with the decision. Now listen to this. Mr. Ross's investigative instincts were roused again last spring when Ms. Schwartz told him about a telephone call she received from Peter Schweizer, an author who had worked with the Ross Schwartz team on two stories about five years ago when the two were at ABC, NBC, sorry, when the two were at NBC News. This time, Mr. Schweizer was offering an exclusive look at galleys of a book he and his wife were finishing on Disney, which had a chapter contending that several Disney theme parks had experienced problems with pedophiles and had resisted cooperating with law enforcement agencies. These people said that the Schwartz 
Ross team had examined more than a dozen theme park resorts, mostly in Florida, but had found that Disney's resorts had more problems than others and that many Florida law enforcement officials said the security staff at the Walt Disney World Resort Complex in Orlando was more uncooperative than staffs elsewhere. Mr. Ross and Ms. Schwartz then had this problem. How could they not focus their report primarily on Disney if that is where their reporting found the facts to be? Now listen to this meeting. It says Mr. Ross and Ms. Schwartz finished a draft version of their report earlier this month and submitted it to Mr. Wald and Mr. Weston for review. Now, Mr. Weston is the president of ABC News. On Tuesday, Mr. Ross and Mr. Weston had a shouting match over Mr. Weston's decision to shelve the report. Shouting that included Mr. Ross asking whether he should quote, call his agent and Mr. Weston saying that he would accept Mr. Ross's resignation on the spot. But apologies were made afterward. People close to both men insist they respect each other and each other's position in this affair. The story was shelved and this is how the article ends. An equally important issue is whether ABC journalists will feel chilled from pursuing stories about Disney. As a Ross admirer at ABC News said, Mr. Ross, quote, tested the outer boundaries of reporting on Disney and found them, end quote. Okay, now I want to take a brief intermission to show you guys some things and then you can decide for yourself whether these are weird, inappropriate innuendos. Because whenever you look into this topic with Disney, you're going to find a lot of, you know, uh, screenshots or short clips of very suggestive scenes in their animations. Now, what makes these look even weirder is that they're actual animations, right? This isn't like you are pausing a live action scene and it just looks that way. These are drawn. So every single stroke on that page is intentional and it goes through several edits and several things. So when you see something that looks really inappropriate, it's hard not to see it as intentional, but it's also very much open to interpretation. So I don't want to sit here and tell you like, this is so weird. I'm going to show you what people have said is weird and you can decide for yourself if it's a reach, right? This is my reaching hat. So let's start with Fantasia. I think Fantasia came out in the 40s. There are racial overtones, but also there are um, topless centaurs as well. So I don't know if it's weird to you. And then I'm sure some of you are familiar with Jessica Rabbit. Um, she was quite an icon. Well, there's a scene if you pause it, you can't really see it. Like if you blink, you'll miss it but people have paused it and it looks like, um, very, reminds me of Sharon Stone in Basic Instinct. Okay, let's just say that. Pause it as often as you like, it's tough to tell. So, I mean, a very graphic, um, so there's that. And then there's also some more nudity and this is confirmed. It was on the rescuers and it's also very quick. Like all of these are like blink and you'll miss it. Um, but there's a full on nude woman in the window as they're like flying through, you know, the, I think it's in New York. And then this one is really controversial and up for interpretation. And even if you look on, look it up on Snopes and fact check it, um, it's, it's a legend, right? And it, it is confirmed that these dust particles in Lion King spelled something. People think it spelled sex, S-E-X, but the animators uh, at Disney said that actually it spells S-F-X, like special effects, and it's an inside joke because it's the special effects people, you know, making a joke using special effects. But it was so controversial, there was actually a lawsuit uh, some mom was like mad about it and sued Disney. And so if you look at the 1995 VHS version and then you compare it with the later version that they put on their streaming service, you'll see that they cut the clip. Uh, so, so that, you know, SFX or SEX is much less visible. So that's up to interpretation. Now, um, there's, this is another one, which I don't, 
it's weird. So like there's a scene in the cartoon Hercules where, you know, something hits his head and you know, like when you hit your head in the cartoon and then there's like, you know, you get a bump on your head or whatever. Well, this one, people are saying it looks like a dickhead. Okay. That's what they're, that's what they're saying. Complete with, you know, the scrotum. Then in one of my favorite Disney animation ones, which is, um, the emperor's new groove, there is a part where Kronk, you know, pull the lever Kronk. He is like sleeping and he pitches a tent, which if you're familiar with that phrase means something. And he pitches it in the same area where, you know, one would, you know, pitch a tent. If you know, <laughs> what has my life become? And then there's also a phallic part of the castle in the little mermaid. And this was pointed out and the animators said that they had drawn this at like four in the morning and they didn't even realize it until there was a controversy and i think in the later um images of this like the movie poster it's removed but um there and there are other ones too throughout the movie of like phallic things that people think is it is it is it not we don't know and then there's bambi when the skunk gets kissed he like turns stiff and red and so people are saying that that's kind of like you know a boner uh, and then this one is insane i i don't i mean look this is cinderella and i'm not even going to say what it looks like because i don't want to be suggesting things to you guys you either see it or you don't okay and for me it it, it doesn't look weird until you look at the expression <laughs> on the mouse's face that has, you know, it, it looks like an expression of pain. Um, so I don't know. Last but not least, this isn't so much an animation thing, but it is a Disney thing. And that is like, you know, those, um, like mechanical rides that they'll have outside of a convenience store. You put in a quarter and then you can like ride the ride. Well, a lot of people talk about this one Donald Duck one where the way he's sitting and the way that the kid would have to sit is very suggestive. And so you can decide for yourself if that is weird or not. That's the end of like the up for interpretation suggestion intermission that I given you, I don't know, whatever. This actually leads me to um, something I wanna talk about because I got some comments in my Nickelodeon video talking about you know, separating the art from the artist, okay? And I wanna talk about that because I think that is important to mention. I didn't mention it in my last video. So uh, a lot of the things in my last video, other than like Ren and Stimpy, most of them, and of course the Dan Schneider stuff, a lot of the things were not necessarily in the art, uh, but it was the artist who did things. So in this case, I feel like it's not the artist as much as the art itself that is the issue. So I'm curious what you guys think about it. This is like a philosophical question. I'm curious. So that's just something, food for thought. Shut up, food for thought. Anyway, let's move on. Now I wanna talk about a news article. What happened is that there was a crew member of the cruise who groped and kissed a 13, no, 11. An 11 year old girl the issue here is that not only did this happen but there was a cover-up afterwards because the protocol for disney like disney's official protocol is if something like this happens you you immediately like confirm it that it happened and then you report it to the authorities right away but what ended up happening is all the way up the captain of the ship told the security guards to shut your mouth what was the reaction when they, you spoke up about it it was just one of you keep your mouth shut. Taplin claims the ship's second in command instructed her not to pick up the phone. If a crime is committed while you're hooked up anywhere here, it is an American, it is a United States, it is a Florida crime period. And actually they were supposed to contact the authorities in Florida who would have had jurisdiction because the ship was still like docked, it was still connected. And so instead of doing that, they left, they got into 
Bahamas territory where the laws are very different and, and um, you know there's like a whole thing about how these cruise companies they register in Bahamas and in the Caribbean because of the taxes and the laws and they have so much sway there because those countries really need that revenue and the fees that they pay to be able to operate there so they kind of get away with a lot of stuff way more than they would in the states plus it's a tax thing too so they ended up not reporting it they ended up making sure that they were in you know bahamian waters they ended up um getting a flight for the crew member who was indian to go back to india and they just wanted to like make the whole thing disappear in my professional and personal opinion i think they wanted to to get outside of uh, the united states limits and just get them off the ship in the bahamas and just leave it alone and i was ordered not to be making any phone calls to anybody instead the disney dream left port canaveral on schedule with the young victim and the suspected crew member milton braganza still on board in a statement disney cruise lines president says quote since our inception millions of guests have put their trust in disney cruise line to provide safe and secure vacations and we take that responsibility very seriously i want to read you some things from an article about this case that it uh, oh. Disney Cruise Line at first claimed last week it did report the crime while the ship was still in port on August 5th. Then, after being told by local six and Port Canaveral police that that was not true, the cruise line changed its account. Company officials then claimed the employees did not know until the next day that a crime was committed. All they knew on August 5th, they claim, was that the child was made to feel uncomfortable, according to statements by the cruise line to both Local 6 and the Port Canaveral Police. But, based on surveillance video and a confidential Disney Cruise Line security incident report obtained by Local 6, that also appears to be false. The report reveals Cruise Line Security began its investigation of the molestation, which it called an, quote, inappropriate sexual act, end quote, at 3.22 p.m. Sunday, August 5th. The child promptly told security the man had repeatedly grabbed her breast, threw her clothes, and forcibly kissed her on the mouth as he cornered her in an elevator on the Disney Dream. She, quote, began to cry, the report stated, as she relayed how the crew member, quote, went like this, end quote, grabbing her breast, and then, then went like this, she said, demonstrating a second groping before he, quote, kissed me here and he put mouth on my mouth, end quote. Such an attack, even through clothing, is under federal law a lewd or lascivious, I always have a hard time saying this word, lascivious, lascivious molestation of a child under 12, a felony punishable by 25 years to life in prison. Okay, so again, not a good look you know why are you trying to cover this up if it could come out later which it did i guess they think it's never going to come out but it's like the truth always comes out eventually and now you're on the wrong side of history had they taken steps immediately because okay here's here's what i think nobody cares but i'm going to tell you it's not necessarily Disney's fault that this happened in the first place because you can vet people, but you, you just never know. And, and any type of employment situation where there's kids, it's going to attract people who have bad motives, right? And, and you can try to filter it out, but they're going to slip through the cracks. The, the, that's not the issue. The issue is what do you do when you find out something like this has happened? Do you do something about it or do you make it worse by covering it up and sending him back to India where he'll presumably do it again? They said that he's not even prevented from working on another cruise ship. There's, they, he didn't get any sort of thing that will prevent him from potentially doing this again. So, you know, the cover up, I feel like makes it so much worse. Even if you go to a park, a public park that's not owned by anyone, right? You know that there's going to be creeps at the park. Everybody knows that. Like, watch out for the random person with no kids who's just staring, right? So that's not the issue. The issue is when you're at a place that's for kids and you're in charge and you're marketing it and you're telling people to come spend money here and bring the kids, when something happens, why are you not even going on your own protocol? going against your protocol, denying what happened to the media, only saying the very little information you have to say when confronted with your own lies. It's, it's just not a good look. 
and maybe their intentions are simply like self-preservation but what what are you willing to do to preserve yourself you know what i mean anyway let's move on let's talk about another bizarre situation that happened and this is also on a disney cruise this one is the disney magic now this is really strange because it happened there was like video footage as well the guy admitted to it but then later on the charges were dismissed this is an article from the miami herald about the situation love it blindfolded a 10 year old boy and spun him around several times as part of a game it was at this time that he fondled the victim's penis outside of the clothing according to a Miami-Dade police arrest report. The Herald also reported that the molestation was captured by surveillance cameras and Lovett confessed to police that he fondled the child. He was arrested, he had a court date, you know, he showed up in court, the news was covering it, and then all of a sudden, the charges were dismissed. And this is what the prosecutor said, why they dismissed the charges. They say that the boy's story changed. I guess he said that it was like, uh, only one second of touching and that he wasn't sure if it was intentional or accidental. Even though video showed contact between them, it did not show lewd contact. And so because of that, they kind of were like, well, we don't believe it anymore, you know, case dismissed. This one is a little bit gray. I'm not sure really what I believe, to be honest. And this is not just low level employees, but also higher ups the executives and the vice presidents. Let's start with John Healy. John Healy is the director of music publishing in, at Disney. He's in charge of like licensing, like all the music that Disney has. He's the guy in charge, okay? And he has been charged with three felony counts of child sexual abuse. Healy's been with Disney since 1981. Let me read you the article. It says, Healy, 58, of Santa Clarita, is accused of sexually abusing two underage girls approximately a decade ago. He allegedly victimized the first girl when she was 15. According to the charges, he began abusing the second when she was about 11 years old and continued until she was 15. In a statement, a Disney spokesman said the company suspended Healy late on Friday after being informed of the charges. Quote, Immediately upon learning of this situation tonight, he has been suspended without pay until the matter is resolved by the courts. AKA, he still works for the company and maybe they're waiting for the charges to get dismissed again. My, my conspiracy allegedly don't sue me. His attorney denied the charges, vehemently denied the charges. Quote, he vehemently denies these allegations and he will be fighting until the end to clear his name. It's a shame. That's all I've got to say. And his Twitter bio says, uh, Disney concerts and living to glorify God in all things. Hmm. So history repeats itself because John Healy's case was dismissed. Actually, John Healy had three trials, okay? It says here, the third trial for a Disney executive charged with sexually assaulting two children over the course of six years was dismissed. The retrial was set because the first and second juries were unable to reach a verdict unanimously. On Tuesday, the court dismissed the case. Quote, the defense asked the court to dismiss the case. People opposed the motion the court dismissed it. Now, let's talk about another higher up. Now, this one was convicted. This is the former vice president of Disney. So this guy was convicted and his victim was seven years old. This happened in Oregon. So it says, the Oregonian reports, 73-year-old Michael Laney was convicted Tuesday of four counts of first-degree sexual abuse after a six-day trial. He was sentenced to six years and nine months. Along with his prison sentence, he will have to pay a $4,000 fine, which is peanuts compared to probably what he makes. And he obviously will have to register as an offender. While conducting their investigation, other victims came forward and said something happened as well when they were younger, but they said that there wasn't sufficient evidence to try him for those crimes. So he only got tried for one, one victim, although there is reportedly potentially more. What he did, after he was a Disney vice president, he founded Warner Brothers. So I don't know if I have to make another video about Warner Brothers now. I, I don't know. Moving on. 
Now I want to talk about something really weird because this actually was like this undercover sting operation uh, against the Catholic Church because that's like a whole different thing with kids. Um, but at, during the course of this investigation, they found a strange connection between Disney and the Catholic Church. Church officials gave a former priest a positive reference to work at Disney World even though they'd fielded at least one allegation about him abusing a boy. The ex-priest Edward Ganster left the priesthood in 1990, moved to the Orlando area, and went on to work at Disney World. I wonder why he chose Disney World. It's not like there's a lot of kids there or anything. But here's the backstory. They say that he, he became a priest in 1971 and that a woman complained that he had gotten in bed with her 13 year old son on an overnight trip and quote hurt him the report said the boy also told his mother that quote something happened in the confession booth and um somebody else also said that they were victimized by him when they were 14 when he was a priest this 14 year old was an altar boy and he said that Ganster fondled, groped, and beat him repeatedly, once dragging him across a living room floor by his underwear and once beating him with a metal cross. All of these allegations were known and then he wanted to work in Disney, at Disney World, so he asked for a recommendation and this is what happened. Allentown's bishop, Thomas Welsh, wrote to Orlando's bishop that Ganster's problems were, quote, partially sexual and that he couldn't reassign him. A Monsignor separately assured Ganster that he would get a positive reference. I am quite sure that the diocese will be able to give you a positive reference in regard to the work you did during your years of service here as a priest. I want to switch gears a little bit and I want to talk about child actors that have spoken out about their experiences. Now Bella Thorne was on this show called Shake It Up. Bella Thorne claimed that she was, since she was like six years old till 14 that she was being abused and that everybody at Disney knew about it and that it was even happening you know while she was on set and that nobody did anything about it. Obviously Bella Thorne is not the only one there's somebody else and her name is Jordan Pruitt. She filed a lawsuit and she included Disney in the lawsuit and this is what she had to say. She was on like The Voice I think and she was one of those contestants. She was into country music and there's like a huge country music scene in Nashville. And so her manager was called Keith Thomas. She claims that he was abusing her since she was 14 years old. And she sued the former label, which is Hollywood Records, that is owned by Disney. Like everything is owned by Disney. Like I'm probably owned by Disney. The suit alleges that the label compelled her to work with Thomas and allowed him to be unsupervised even though it knew or should have known that he was an abuser. She said, unfortunately, these large companies are primarily concerned with sales, money, and charts. Too often they fall short of protecting the young talent that they are supposed to be caretakers for. Time and time again, we see people in positions of power fail us. I couldn't be more disappointed in how Disney treats their underage talents like cash cows. She gave details of what happened and it's very graphic but I think it's important to listen to because it, t it teaches us a lot about the tactics that they use, how they groom, what they say, why people don't speak out. Um, so even though it's really graphic I think that you know her story should be told especially because she wants to tell it. Pruitt alleges that the abuse began when she was 14 and continued until a week before her 16th birthday. She claims that it involved kissing and oral sex and that Thomas took her virginity. She also alleges that on one occasion she was drugged and anally penetrated. She alleges that the abuse occurred at the Staples Center on sound stages at the Warner Brothers lot, in artist trailers, hotel rooms, and in parked cars. She says that part of the grooming process was that he would cut off contact, cut off her contact with boys her age and that he would put her down with negative insults about the way she looks, but then he would also give her really nice compliments. 
And she says that he would tell her things like he loved her and that nobody other than him understood how special she was and that their love was uh, a special secret. And she says that he also groomed her mother and got her to trust him so that he was able to spend time with her alone. But there's more. So there's another Disney star I want to talk about and this is a guy. His name is Ricky Garcia. He was on the Disney Channel show Best Friends Whenever. He filed a complaint against his talent manager. He said that Joby Hart, his talent manager, basically raped him. That this happened on a weekly basis. In one incident outlined in the lawsuit, Hart arranged for a two-night songwriting retreat for himself and Garcia's boy band forever in your mind on Catalina Island. Parents were not allowed to attend. I don't know how, oh, not allowed, like who decides? Like, if, uh, you can't stop me, is, what, what? It says, during this trip, Garcia's attorneys say Hart sexually assaulted Garcia while he was drunk. Garcia's attorneys allege Hart not only raped and sexually assaulted him, quote, dozens of times throughout his teenage years, but also groomed him into a personal sexual plaything that could be passed around among Hart's colleagues. Who's involved? Who's doing, you know, like, like how far does this go? Speaking of the actors, um, not all of them are victims. This is a case where the actor was the perpetrator and it was an older actor. His name is Stoney Westmoreland and he played the grandfather on the Disney show Andy Mack. He actually got caught up in a sting operation because what happened was he was on Grindr, he's gay, and he even has like a partner that's his age. So he was on Grindr, which if you don't know Grindr, it's like a dating app, uh, also kind of like a hookup app um, for gay people. So he was on there and he thought he was talking to somebody who identified himself as a 13 year old boy, but actually was a cop. So it was like modern day to catch a predator. So according to the police report, he was sending nudes to the boy after he found out that the boy was 13 years old. Then he went so far as to like get an Uber to go and meet the boy and had plans to, you know, do the deed with the 13 year old and he is um, 48. And this happened in Utah, Salt Lake City. He was arrested by Vice and charged with four counts of dealing in materials harmful, oh, excuse me, to a minor and one count enticing a minor by internet or text. The disturbing thing here is that the age of the boy he was trying to meet up with is the same age as his co-stars on the TV show, Andy Mack. Let me tell you the shows he's been on. ABC Scandal, Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad, NCIS. He also directed uh, Golden Boy and was featured in the movies Godzilla and Matchstick Men. So his case is ongoing. He's been trying everything to get out of it. Because he's gay and because this happened in Salt Lake City, uh, he's claiming that the judge, because you know, I don't know if you remember this, but I'm from California, so I do. There was the Prop 8 that was actually funded by the Mormon church in California. And so his attorneys tried to say that the judge needs to be removed from the case because of his bias, because he somehow connected to that movement. And so since Westmoreland is openly gay, and I think he's he was married to at the time, or had a partner or something, um, you know, he was saying that this, that he would be like biased, just based on the fact that, you know, he's gay. And so he needs to be removed from the case. So that's all pending. And then with COVID, things have been like the last article that I found said that the trial was supposed to be March 30th, 2020. As we know, that's right when there were lockdowns and everything was kind of going crazy and there's really hasn't been anything developing since then. So I'm not sure what's up with that. Maybe there's something and I missed it. That's also like a major possibility. So now I want to talk about Harvey Weinstein, of course. The reason I'm mentioning him is because at the time that he did all the things he was accused of and convicted of actually, he had that company Miramax and that's when he had that company, that's when he did a lot of the things he did. And you guessed it, that company is owned by Disney. And so there's a lawsuit that was filed 
against him, but also it named Disney. So I thought I'd mention it here because they say that Disney executives knew about Weinstein and what he was doing. Is it Weinstein or Weinstein? Harvey. Let's just say Harvey. So Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein. I feel like that's what everybody says. Anyway, so uh, the lawsuit alleges that Disney executives knew, but they turned a blind eye because money. So I'd love to know what you guys think about that and pretty much all the other things I said. And hopefully this video was informative. Um, and I know it's disturbing, but I feel like these are the kind of things that I want to talk about. I think it should be talked about. Uh, a lot of these things are brushed under the rug. And also, I think there's a lot of shame and fear when you talk about these things. It's like the more you talk about it and you normalize it, it makes it easier for the victims to do the same because a lot of the problem in the situations is that there's statutory, not statutory, there's a statute of limitations for a lot of these crimes and there's also a huge problem with people saying these things happened at the time that they're happening. A lot of times it takes a long time to say these things. You deal with shame, you blame yourself, you think nobody's going to believe you. There's a lot that goes behind it. So I think that, you know, this helps maybe people talk about it sooner, hopefully, but also I think legally the statute of limitations should be extended for these types of crimes because of the nature of the fact that the victims usually it takes them time to speak out about it that's my two cents um anyway thank you guys so much for watching uh please subscribe if you haven't already and i will see you guys in the next one bye